Hello. Today we're going to be looking at U.S. History, Chapter 17, The New Frontier and the Great Society. What we're looking at in, in this chapter is really the presidencies of uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, or JFK, and Lyndon Baines Johnson, or LBJ, who succeeded him as president. And so as we start out into this chapter, uh, and we move into the first section, the main idea is that President Kennedy continued the Cold War policy of resisting the spread of communism by offering to help nations and threatening to use force if necessary. Our learning objectives are to describe the ways that Kennedy's election as president suggested change and to describe the major Cold War conflicts of the Kennedy administration. So looking first of all at Kennedy's election. John F. Kennedy came from a wealthy, politically connected family. He was good looking, young, relatively, for a president, and comfortable in front of television cameras. People felt that Kennedy represented the future. So he runs for president in the election of 1960, and he adopted the term New Frontier. And he played on the nation's Cold War fears. He claimed that the nation's prosperity was not reaching the poor. He rallied the African-American vote when Kennedy called Coretta King after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested. Robert Kennedy, or Bobby, his brother, persuaded the judge to release King. And he won one of the closest elections in history. Now, his opponent in the 1960 election was Richard Nixon. We talked about Richard Nixon in a previous chapter. Uh, in, back in 1952, Nixon was selected as Eisenhower's running mate in the 1952 presidential election uh, and, of course, saved his spot uh, after he was accused of being dishonest by uh, going on TV in what became known as his checkers speech. So Nixon uh, ends up running for president in 1960. Uh, so he is the sitting vice president as Eisenhower is preparing to leave, and he runs, of course, against Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy defeated Nixon in one of the closest elections in U.S. history. Uh, looking at the vote, as far as the electoral vote, Kennedy took 303 electoral votes to Nixon's 219. Uh, but as far as states carried, uh, Kennedy actually only carried 22 states, as where Nixon carried 26. But in the popular vote, uh, he had a slight margin of really, uh, really only probably about 100,000 votes. Uh, he actually won by 49.7 to 49.6 percent. So uh, we're talking a tenth of a percent separating the two candidates in terms of the popular vote. And one real key in this election was the first tele televised debate in history. Uh, most experts believe that this is what really probably tipped the election to Kennedy. Nixon insisted on campaigning up until just a few hours before the first debate started. And he had not completely recovered from a hospital stay and thus looked pale and sickly. Uh, kind of looked also underweight and tired. He refused makeup for the first debate, and as a result, his beard stubble showed prominently on the era's black and white TV screens. Kennedy, by contrast, rested and prepared extensively beforehand. He appeared tanned, confident, and relaxed during the debate. An estimated 70 million viewers watched the first debate. People who watched the debate on television overwhelmingly felt that Kennedy won, while radio listeners, which was a much smaller audience, felt that Nixon had won. And that really showed how the image of the candidate being conveyed in, in, uh, on the television screen changed people's perceptions, because those that listened to the debate only on the radio thought that Nixon won. Those that actually watched it on TV, where they had the visual component, felt that Kennedy had won. And there is a great likelihood that Kennedy's performance in the debate versus Nixon's performance 
ultimately tipped the election, being that it was such a close election. <clears throat> so Kennedy takes office. Uh, in his inaugural address, he focused on change, and it really had a strong anti-communist tone. He did not specify his domestic policy goals because so much division existed over domestic issues. Now, as far as advisors, uh, Kennedy gathered a group of what some called the best and the brightest as his advisors. Most of Kennedy's advisors were young, and his closest advisor, his closest advisor rather, was his brother, Bobby. Uh, cabinet members had less influence than the White House advisors. And one new challenge that he was going to have to deal with was Cuba. Fidel Castro was in power in Cuba. Castro had come to power uh, in 1959 during the Eisenhower administration and became uh, the leader of Cuba after a guerrilla war. And he promised to restore people's rights and freedoms, but once in power, he seized private businesses and made overtures to the Soviet Union, which immediately made him an enemy of the United States. So a, an invasion plan was put forth uh, during the Eisenhower administration, and they agreed to train Cuban exiles for this mission. So when Kennedy becomes president, he inherits this invasion plan, and he decides to go ahead with it. Um, so what was happening is the CIA was training troops, these troops being Cuban exiles uh, that had came here to the United States, training them to go back into Cuba and to topple Castro. Uh, Kennedy's advisors were mixed, and Kennedy was worried about communism spreading to Latin America, so he gave the go-ahead. Now, now, the invasion force was launched at a place called the Bay of Pigs, and that's thus what the invasion becomes known as, the Bay of Pigs invasion. It failed. Uh, partially, Kennedy kind of backed off a little bit on some airstrikes that would have provided support, uh, and information was leaked early. Like I said, the airstrikes failed. Castro prepared for, was prepared for a land attack, and the invaders were captured and then ransomed back to the United States. And that strengthened Castro's ties to the Soviet Union and also became a huge embarrassment for the Kennedy administration. Even though Eisenhower did come forward and kind of accept responsibility for the planned invasion, uh, the fact of the matter is Kennedy still gave the go-ahead, and ultimately it looked bad on Kennedy. We also experienced a crisis in Berlin during this time frame. Uh, we've already, of course, talked in previous chapters about how Berlin had been divided uh, by the Soviets into uh, where they kept, you know, we actually at the end of World War II divided up the city of Berlin into four sectors, and the Americans, the French, and the British reunified their sectors. but that was in opposition to what the Soviets wanted, and they kept their sector, their sectors of both Berlin and of Germany separate and set up communist governments. So Nikita Khrushchev, who became the leader after Joseph Stalin passed away, uh, or became the leader, I should say, of the Soviet Union, Khrushchev demanded that the United States recognize East Germany as an independent communist nation. West Berlin was an, item, an island rather, of freedom. And, and to understand that, what you have to remember is that the city of Berlin, which was the capital of Germany historically, was located deeply within the Soviet-held sector of the city or of uh, of Germany. And you know, when they divided up Germany into four sectors, the sector that was held by the Soviets, which becomes you know now that you know they recognize it as East Germany, a communist nation, the city of Berlin is deep within that sector. And so the city of West Berlin, which is, is now divided from East Berlin, becomes this isolated pocket of, dem of democracy and freedom located right inside the Soviet-held sector. And Khrushchev doesn't like that. And so uh, Kennedy really kind of refused to be bullied around by Khrushchev, and he sent troops into West Germany, uh, built nuclear shelters, and then waited for Khrushchev's next move. And the next move really came on August 13, 1961, when Khrushchev closed the crossing points between East and West Berlin. And a high concrete wall was built to prevent further escapes to freedom. Now, of course, the, 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 uh, 
Soviets at this point in time claimed that the wall is really being built to prevent Westerners from coming into East Berlin or into East Germany, but in, a, in actuality it was really the opposite. East Germans were trying to escape to freedom in West Berlin, and so this, this concrete wall is built up. And early on there were numerous escapes made. Uh, some people uh, fled through buildings. Literally there were apartment complexes that were right on the border, and through some of those, uh, while they built a brick wall right up to the apartments, you could climb out through the windows and actually end up into West Germany, or, or I should say West Berlin. Uh, so many people escaped to freedom that way. Eventually the Soviets came in and cleared out those buildings and then bricked up the walls entirely so that people couldn't escape that way. Um, and we also had a very tense standoff at a place that becomes known as Checkpoint Charlie. Uh, Kennedy sent more troops and Vice President Lyndon Johnson uh, visited Berlin and shortly after the erection of the Berlin Wall this standoff occurs between US and Soviet tanks on either side of Checkpoint Charlie. It began on October 22nd as a dispute over whether East German guards were authorized to examine the papers of a diplomat named Alan Leitner passing through East Berlin to see the opera. Uh, by October 27th, 10 Soviet and an equal number of American tanks stood on opposite sides of the checkpoint, and the standoff finally ended peacefully on October 28th. Kennedy said a wall is a lot better than a war. Over time, the wall was extended and fortified. Now, of course, eventually, uh, Kennedy would travel to Berlin where he would give his famous I am a Berliner speech in which speaking in German uh, he would would say he was a Berliner 